Actually, uh, my topic is, is the same. <laughs> but of course, my, my sort of twists and turns and angles are a bit, uh, are, are a bit different, but, but essentially I'm talking about the same stuff. Uh, but, and let me, but let me add to that, but, and, and that's more sort of when it comes to war stories. Since you mentioned Turkey, I was actually in Ankara doing the IMF program 20 years ago. And we were struggling the whole night. And uh, when everybody else had given up, Stan Fisher gave me a call and said, how are things? And I said, give me two more hours. And he had the board waiting, he gave me two more hours, and we fixed it. And then we had coffee with the Bülent Echevit, the prime minister, at nine o'clock in the morning the next day. And it's been pretty sad, actually, given what you showed us, what happened after that, because things were actually doing okay for quite some time. And then it went completely the other, the other way. So I'm all with you and all your comments on what is, what is going on on now, uh, and the short story of the whole thing, uh, which is not specific to Turkey, is uh, many have tried to defy gravity, and you always know the end result. It's not harder than that. But before I get into my, my stuff, let me mention uh, two numbers. First number is 50. Uh, it's 50 years ago, exactly in August 50 years ago, it was the first time I opened the door, and that was quite humiliating, the big wooden door at the Stockholm School of Economics. So in that sense, it's kind of a homecoming. homecoming. And uh, the other part of the story, which uh, almost no one has heard of, is that about 25 years ago, I organized a lunch with all the moneyed, moneyed people in this country, the major banks. And I told them, because I was back then deputy governor, I said, we do not do enough financial sector research in this country. You guys do not understand what is going on. We need an endowment with at least 100 million. They hated that bunch. <laughs> <laughs> but now the Stockholm, uh, the SH SHOF exists. And that was on my side, a tiny, tiny contribution making it possible 25 years ago. And there's been many twists and turns and up and down since, since then, but uh, that's how it uh, uh, started. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a small open economy, and AE stands for referring to Sebron's papers, uh, an advanced uh, economy, and what I've sort of had in my head for quite some, uh, quite some time. Uh, so let me start with uh, some stylized facts. Uh, and th there are many ways of describing the openness of, 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 of an economy. So this can be done in many different ways. And this is at least one way, way of doing it. But let me also, before I get into the slides, say that I've done all of this completely on my own. So bear with me if uh, some of the slides aren't perfect. And it has absolutely nothing to do with Swedish monetary policy at present. And that is also, also important. Others know what is going on presently, I don't. This is one way of describing openness. Export imports are roughly 50% of GDP, which is fairly actually similar to, uh, similar to China. And that's usually how we think about openness, uh, moving stuff around and, and, and what they're thinking about how, we, how open we are and what we, uh, what we do, uh, do with it. Another way of looking at openness is basically to look at what's happening in your own economy and what is happening in the rest of the world. And this is what it looks like uh, ending in, in uh, 2020, roughly. If you look at the GDP growth numbers, and uh, the uh, red, bar, uh, red line is basically trade -weighted, a trade-weighted index, and the blue one is, of course, uh, Sweden. Correlation is 0.85. And then if you, if you look at the policy rate, the correlation is 0.92. And that means that another way of thinking about that is basically to say that to some extent you can use domestic policies if things happen in the rest of the world that you need to deal with, so to speak, in one way or the other. But you cannot, given this degree of openness, compensate for what's going on in the rest of the world completely. So in that sense, in a small open economy, and Sweden here is the truly a small open economy, uh, it's like sailing on the ocean in a small boat, and then you better know how to sail. 
And if you don't, you're going to end up with a problem sooner or later, one, uh, one way or the other. And it doesn't really matter in terms of the numbers, uh, how, how many observations you have, but, but this is where we are right now. So if you add the policy rates uh, on the, on the right-hand, out, out there on the right-hand side, then of course correlation probably would go up. Uh, that, is my, uh, that is my guess, because right now, given the inflation in, the rest, in, in here and in the rest of the world, everybody's sort of in one way or the other, almost everybody moving in the, sa in the same, uh, in the same di uh, the direction. So that's one way of sort of describing from a stylized facts pers perspective what is, uh, what, what is going on. Another measure, and I must say, is to look at the current account surplus. And here, basically, we have had a current account surplus since roughly 1995. I still find it hard to talk about a surplus because when I was studying economics, we always had a very sizable deficit. And back then, we thought that this problem could never, ever be fixed. Uh, but eventually, it was actually fixed. And this is what it has looked like now for quite some, uh, quite some uh, time. And uh, generally speaking, this is a good, considered to be a good thing. The other part, when it comes to stylized facts, is to look at central government debt to GDP. And it's around 17% right now, 1.7. And that reminds me of complicated papers my staff uh, wrote at the IMF in the early 2000s when we thought that U.S. debt would go to zero. And you know what has, <laughs> <laughs> and you know what has happened after, after, uh, after, after, after that. But there is also one, one point which is important here if you go to 96, 97, because back then I was deputy governor at the Riksbank, and all of a sudden Stanley Fisher showed up out of the blue and wanted to have dinner. And that was a secret first warning sign that from the IMF side, basically saying, guys, we're watching you, and you better behave because we might, up, we might show up for real. And that was a very sobering dinner. And then, of course, as you can see, we got our act together. And if we continue like this for a bit more time, then eventually the only thing you can do if this goes to zero, which I don't think is going to happen, is to start an oil fund <laughs> and then invest, invest abroad. Because you have to do something with the, uh, something with the, uh, with the, with, with the money in, one, in one, form, uh, one form or the other. Now, of course, if you look at many, many other countries presently, this is a very extreme situation. And based on, and, and, and based on this, one would think, and I'll get to that in a few minutes, that, that the exchange rate actually would appreciate instead of depreciating. But let me also very, very briefly, and I'm not at all going to get into, in, into this when it comes to the details, uh, and, and uh, look at inflation. And here, this is sort of roughly a 200-year perspective. And if you look at these numbers, you can see that uh, this country has been done reasonably OK compared to many other countries for hundreds of years. So we are not really into a lot into inflation. And if you look at this graph, you can say that well, this is what we're struggling with presently, uh, but if we get it right in a very long-term perspective, it cannot be a major, in, major issue. So eventually, inflation will come down one, one, uh, one sooner, or, uh, sooner or later. But a real issue uh, that many central banks, most central banks have, have, have had to deal with is the fact that we weren't really used to this, because we have this period with very low inflation, and people haven't really do, studied a lot what happened, let's say, here, because this is what is called the Korea inflation. And that was uh, the last time before this episode that you could actually study what happens when sort of strange things happen in the, in the economy. So that was kind of forgotten. And then it's not all that surprising that it took a while before people say, well, you know, prices are going up and they aren't going to come down immediately, so we've got to do something about, about this. Now, another way of describing in a very stylized way what is going on and has been going on in the economy since the 80s is to look at uh, this kind of macro summary, GDP, and uh, uh, GDP per capita, and annual change. And things have, on average, looked OK because GDP increases, but look at the red bars. What do they say, and this is important in a small open economy, 
This is our own domestically created and induced financial crisis. And it cost you a lot to create a mess. Given the openness of the economy, this is the global financial crisis. And then you have all the euro issues. And here we have the pandemic. And that, of course, kind of tells you that don't mess up on your own. Because somebody else is going to mess up sooner or later anyway. And you're going to have to deal with, you're going to have to deal with that as best as you, as best as you uh, can. And that is, that is of course, uh, that is, of course, uh, uh, important. And then finally, when it comes to the exchange rate, and uh, I normally I have never talked about the real exchange rate, and this is the real trade weighted exchange rate, uh, because most people don't care about that. But I think it's worthwhile saying a few words about it. And if you look at it at, at the at the orange graph, you can see that the real trade weighted exchange rate has been depreciating for the past 10 years. And I think that that's something that matters. How it matters, what it really means, hard to tell. But it's a story which is quite different compared to the way people write about the exchange rate, let's say, in the newspapers. And it really would be worthwhile when it comes to doing some serious research, uh, trying to uh, understand this, trying to dissect this and see is there something going on in the economy that makes us worse off in terms of trade, education, productivity, whatnot? I don't know, because I don't know the answer to this. The other interesting part of it, which sort of goes hand in hand with, with, uh, with the story, with the stylized facts that I showed you earlier, and these are the, na these are nation the National Institute of Economic Research Calculation, is that they always say that the exchange rate is going to appreciate. And it would be actually quite interesting for somebody to take a look at these projections for the past 25 years. Because I'm pretty sure that both when it comes to central bank projections and the NIER projections, they always say that the exchange rate is going to appreciate. Given, and given the stylized facts, it's not a totally crazy idea. But then, of course, the underlying issue is that but is it going to happen or not, and where are, things, where are things going? And it's important to keep in mind then that I'm not talking about the next quarter, the next year, or anything like that. I'm talking about more long-term uh, long issues. More when it comes to stylized facts in this type of economy, and, and this is sort of background stuff that, one can, that you have to be mindful of. Sweden's a member of the EU since quite some time. So we have free movement of goods. We can argue about free movement of services, but at least on paper it's supposed to be there, but certainly when it comes to goods. We have free movement of labor, despite that it being strongly disliked nowadays by some in this country. Uh, uh, but that's a different, uh, different story. Uh, we have definitely free movement of capital. And these, 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 these are sort of Precon a precondition for all macro policies. You cannot do away with this. You just have to live with it and accept it. That's the way things are. And the same holds when it comes to a precondition for all financial sector policies, what you do in the financial sector. Because you, you move stuff around and you move money around, and you have completely free uh, currency uh, uh, convertibility. And that's not just going to, to, to change. Now, at the same time, when it comes to what really happens in countries, a few, few words on exchange rates again. Sweden has a floating exchange rate. Denmark has a euro peg. And Finland adopted uh, the euro. And all three countries actually, as always, had issues. But all three countries have done quite well if you compare to many, many other countries. And that's, of course, maybe a bit puzzling but it's sort of telling you the story that maybe it's not only about the exchange rate. Exactly. There is something else. There is something else in, in, in this. But I do think, though, that one issue, one, one statement is, is uh, important here. And that is that balanced economic policies are compatible with different currency regimes. But your choice of currency regime can never save you from unbalanced policies. So if you try to defy gravity, you're going to fall and stumble sooner or later, either because you end up with all sorts of other problems and whatever currency regime you have chosen 
kind of holds, which is unlikely, or you are just going to change your currency regime uh, sooner or uh, later. And if history gives us any guidance, that is usually what uh, that is usually what, uh, what what happens. And I'm not making any other comparisons, but I know how Argentina functions or does not function from within quite well. And that's usually where they end up trying to change another, to another currency regime, and it doesn't save them. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, you have kind of to, 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 to behave and behave better. This is textbook stuff, so I'm not going to go through this. this two, you have capital mobility, exchange rate regime, and uh, monetary uh, sovereignty. Choose two, and you get the third. And clearly, in the case of Denmark with the fixed exchange rate, they do not have monetary sovereignty. In the case of Sweden, it makes sense to, if you have a floating, uh, floating exchange rate and capital mobility to opt for an inflation target. It's sort of a combination that, uh, that makes sense. And it's not all that surprising, I think, that the Riksbank Bank intervened the last time in 2002 or something like that for a, lo a long, long, a long, long time, uh, time ago. But having, so, and, and this is, of course, one thing that, that comes back again and again and again when you start discussing the exchange rate, and particularly in many emerging markets, because what you do is that you set both the policy rate, you have an inflation target, and you try to manipulate the exchange rate at the same time. And that won't work. <laughs> and that has been tried time and time again in, 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 different, uh, in, in different, uh, di dif different, different ways. So in that sense, I would say as a nation, uh, we have uh, behaved. Now, one more issue, though, in this, and this is the Helen Ray argument from, from Jackson Hole, I think it's 2018, 2019, something like that, is basically that this trilemma becomes a dilemma because with free capital flows, regardless of your choice of exchange rate regime, uh, you are actually uh, going to have fewer degrees of freedom than in the past. And that has something to do with, uh, with the integration uh, with the rest of the world, and particularly when it comes to capital, capital flows in one, one, way or, uh, one way or the other. And I do think that that is, that is quite, uh, quite important. Uh, so those were some of the stylized facts. Now let, let's move over from macro to what I call financialization. And I do think that, uh, that this, uh, this, uh, th this matters. And, the fir and this can again be done in many, many different ways. The first one is basically household debt, which is the converse of government debt. Because if the government borrows less, households borrow more. That is what it, uh, what it, uh, what it actually looks like. And essentially, uh, what has happened if you do the numbers and you look at the banking sector, basically Swedish banks are not commercial banks anymore. Basically, Swedish banks are mortgage banks. That is what has, uh, that is what, uh, what, has uh, what, what has happened. And that's an issue in itself. Let me come up with a few other measures of finalization. You can always argue a lot about these numbers. Here I'm talking about monetary financial institutions and uh, their asset side, 18, uh, and, and uh, how much, what, what has happened here. And as you can see, it has really, really grown. And then I've added the pension fund sector to, uh, to this. And in GDP terms, this, uh, we're talking about something which is four times GDP. And this is a very, very large financial sector, given the size, uh, given the size of uh, the economies. No, no question about that. We can also argue about these numbers, but this is what it looks like. It's hard to see the country names here. But here I'm talking about total assets in the banking sector uh, in a EU uh, setting. Denmark, Sweden up there. And then when it comes to pensions, uh, you can see Sweden and Finland uh, up there. So also, this is also another way of sort of, in terms of country ranking, to show uh, a nation which is uh, extremely financialized. And then we always talk about Swedish banks being well capitalized. This is roughly the leverage ratio. We're down here. This is not a good number. In this country, we like to fool ourselves to always say that Swedish banks are strong. Why are they strong? Because the risk weights are so low. The only thing that matters when things go south is the leverage ratio, not risk weights. Mm -hmm. And presently in this country, and this is sort of completely out of context, there is a discussion about taxing the banks more. A much better solution would actually be to jack up the leverage ratio substantially because that would force the banks to keep the money in the banks. 
And that's a good thing given our degree of financialization. So what is, the, is it that we have done then? We have had 30 years where we've gone from fiscal dominance to potential financial dominance. And that's a completely different environment when we think about how economies actually behave when things happen that we aren't really used to discussing and thinking all that hard, hard, hard about. But these are facts, and these, these things, uh, this is what has happened. And also in terms of how we do the modeling and all the technical stuff is actually quite different in this environment compared to an assumption that the financial sector is almost, almost non, uh, non-existent. What also matters, uh, but not from a modeling perspective, is that if you look at what we have done, one can argue that Sweden is a reluctant member of the EU. And not to be blunt, we're only half a member of the EU. <laughs> That's another way of uh, putting it. What does that mean? We are not part of the monetary union. We are not part of the banking, uh, banking union, because the argument was that we're much better at supervision ourselves. I would rather argue that you are much closer to the Bankers Association, and I don't think that that's a good choice. Uh, And the risk of regulatory capture is much higher. And it's also a fact that for, for the past 20 years, roughly, the IMF has looked into the Swedish financial sector three times. And all three times they come up with the same conclusion. One is that uh, the FSA is under, under-resourced and that supervision is not intrusive enough. And that's against this finalization background that I've been talking about that people prefer to forget about. And also, if you look at on, on, right there on the right-hand side when it comes to domestic institutional change, as a consequence of all these things, nothing has happened except that we put in place a macroprudential framework where de facto the finance uh, finance minister has a veto, uh, which is another way of saying that uh, to put in place a tough regulatory framework, we'll see. So what has happened here when it comes to a small open economy? We have gone from being a rule maker when everything was handled domestically to de facto a rule taker. There is no question, uh, question about that. And we have gone from fixed before 92 to a floating exchange rate. So we, we tried to be a price maker. That didn't work. To a price taker when it comes to the exchange rate. Now, what does that mean? Well, it basically means that status quo requires macro stability in one form or the other. Because if macro stability is not there, then uh, bad things can uh, happen in the economy. What that also implies is that it is very, very important to avoid major mistakes, because they will be hard to uh, correct. And then I would lo- I, I want to argue that there is a different be- difference between what is perceived and actual sovereignty. So in that sense, in a small open economy, basically you are boxed in. But in a small open economy, maybe it doesn't matter because where I grew up in Finland, we used to say we don't get rich from uh, chopping wood for each other. You got to sell stuff to others. That's where your standard of living actually comes from. But this is then what you have to, uh, to, uh, to live with. And that essentially means that there are limited, limited uh, degrees, of, uh, degrees of freedom. And when you think about those degrees of freedom, I'm, st- I'm start talking about productivity, education, efficiency in the economy, and things like that. Because that is, in a harsh competitive world, is what actually increases your standard of living uh, over time, not tweaking the policy rate 25 basis points up or down. Uh, that's interesting to follow on a daily basis if you're a market participant, but there are other things uh, that turn you into a wealthy nation over time. So with those words, thank you for your attention. <laughs>